Okay. Um, in starting this case, I want to see under hematologic um, conditions or disorders, we'll be discussing two main disorders, anemias and uh, sickle cell disease. So uh, hopefully in the next, for the first session, we'll take anemias and then the second session, we'll talk about sickle cell disease. Both conditions are really, really common in Nigeria. Um, one, because of diets, that's for anemias, it's common because of diet deficiencies, which are also underscored by the high prevalence of poverty in Nigeria. So um, for a lot of people, anemias are more related to the dietary uh, sources, which is also really related to poverty. And um, on the other hand, for sickle cell disease, which also, uh, which is a chronic disorder, um, it, it's more related to the genetics, so the, the phenotypic expression in the, in the individual. Uh, so for those who are homozygous HBS, that's the patients who are SS, which we usually call sickle cell disease, uh, that's a chronic condition. Um, of course, there are some experimental um, treatments now that think of, uh, that, that are organized around bone marrow transplantation using different methods. Uh, but, you know, that's still largely unavailable or inaccessible to the large number of Nigerians who have that disease. So, uh, to get started, let's quickly talk about anemias. Uh, there's probably no one in this class who uh, has not either had an anemic uh, episode before or known someone who has, who has had an anemia before. It's common in pregnancy uh, where the diet is not sufficiently, um, sufficiently where the diet does not provide all the macronutrients and the micronutrients required to uh, maintain or increase the hemoglobin in the blood. It's also common when there are um, chronic diseases as well. Chronic diseases that can result into um, either blood loss or that result into increased um, loss of red blood cells. So anemia is a group of diseases characterized by decreasing hemoglobin or red blood cells, resulting in decreased oxygen carrying capacity of blood. And that points to why the clinical manifestations for anemias can include things like um, gasping for breath or, um, or you know, panting after or getting tired after a small activity. Uh, the World Health Organization defines anemia as uh, having a blood test, uh, having a hemoglobin result less than 13 grams per DL in men or less than 12 grams per DL in women. Now, these numbers do not, uh, um, do, do not apply to all, uh, all um, men and all women. But for most people who have visited hospitals when they were well, uh, their normal might vary significantly around the numbers we mentioned here. So you may have a man's normal that is lower than this or a woman's number that is lower or higher, sorry, higher than this. So uh, it's important not to say somebody is not anemic just because uh, you know, they do not meet these numbers as long if th these are mainly benchmarks. So it mainly says that uh, in our population, at least 95% um, of people, you know, when they are normal will have, uh, you know, male will have hemoglobin of about 13 grams per DL or higher. And for women will have 12 grams per DL or, or uh, slightly higher. Um, anemia can, uh, in terms of the source, when we look at uh, what results into it, can have 
three main functional classifications can be hypoproliferative, so which means uh, there's bone marrow damage and so uh, not enough red blood cells are being produced. Uh, it can also reduce, uh, occur from high ion deficiency. Ion deficiency can also mean that less hemoglobin is being made in the bone marrow, okay? Um, this is essentially from decreased stimulation. Uh, those that also re uh, result from decreased stimulation can include uh, renal disease. Of course, renal disease can cause anemia. In fact, it's one of the uh, clinical pictures that you see when patients report with renal disease. In inflammatory disease as well, it's common. And then in people with metabolic diseases like hypertension and diabetes, where you have um, maturation disorder, Where you have um, issues with maturation disorders, you can have things like cytoplasmic defects, um, like people who have thalassemia, which is also a phenotypic expression of uh, a genetic disorder, uh, iron deficiency, that usually results from diet, and then sideroblastic uh, anemia as well. Then there's nuclear maturation defects. Uh, for example, folate deficiency results into nuclear maturation defects, B12 deficiency, and they can also be refractory anemia. And then when patients have a lot of blood loss, you can also have, um, you can also have um, that leading to anemia. So blood loss, intravascular hemolysis, autoimmune dis uh, disease, for example, people with um, autoimmune disorders, right, can also, um, that can lead to uh, anemia, uh, hemoglobinopathies, and then metabolic or membrane uh, defects. Now, what's the disease process? Um, just to I mean, we've classified the kind of disease processes that can lead to that, for example, hyperproliferation, maturation disorders, hemorrhage, or hemolysis. Uh, but also to mention that the different types of cells may usually be associated. I mean, this is not particularly um, a useful classification right now, uh, but you can see there's microcytic anemia when it's associated with iron deficiency, that smaller cells are more affected. In that case, you can also have normocytic, where normal sized cells, um, that happens with blood loss and chronic disease conditions. There can also be large blood cells that are, uh, you know, that are fewer in number when you have that large red blood cells, um, where you have um, anemia resulting from deficiencies of B12 or folic acid. Um, iron deficiency anemia can be caused by inadequate dietary intake, inadequate uh, GI absorption. Uh, for yeah. example, for example, patients who are taking uh, their supplements, their iron supplements with um, uh, other medicines that can chelate uh, the iron out of their diet. For example, uh, antacids right, that can lead to anemia if they can't, you know, get their iron from other sources. Uh, they, when there's also increased iron demand, like I mentioned earlier on, in pregnancy, this is common. Uh, when there's blood loss as well, for example, uh, if there's been a trauma, a trauma or uh, an accident or maybe surgery and other uh, conditions, you can have uh, anemia results and, and then chronic diseases, like I said, like uh, diabetes, hypertension, renal disease, very importantly. Now, um, B12 and folic acid deficiency can also cause anemia, and but these ones usually read, uh, occur because of inadequate dietary intake or use of, uh, uh, for example, uh, fat blockers can result into some B vitamin losses, okay, leading to uh, anemia. Um, 
some of the drugs that can cause anemia uh, by reducing absorption of folic acid can include phenytoin, uh, which is used for convulsion. It's also uh, a medicine that patients need to take for a prolonged period of time. So you need to work with your patients to either stagger the administration of the ion supplements if they're not able to absorb ion or folic acid from their gut, right, or from their diet. So you need to stagger the administration of their medicines and their uh, folic, folic acid, okay? Or when your patient is using uh, on anti-cancer medicines like methotrexate, it's important to uh, supplement with um, a folic acid that is not inhibited by uh, methotrexate. There can also be anemia of inflammation. Um, it's been recently described it's a hypoproliferative anemia that's uh, traditionally been associated with infectious or <laughs> processes. Not uh, Listen. Listen. Please, please mute yourself. Uh, if you have a question, you can raise your hand and then uh, we'll take the question. Okay. So, uh, inflammation um, that can result into this is, uh, for example, cancer cachexia. Uh, which is an inflammatory condition that results into uh, general inflammation and uh, uh, metabolic disorders can result into uh, anemia of inflammation, okay? Um, it can be caused by chronic infection as well. Um, in patients with TB, uh, also in patients with HIV, uh, you can find um, anemia of inflammation as well. There's also age-related reductions in bone marrow reserve that can render elderly patients more susceptible to anemia, and it can be caused by multiple minor and often recognized diseases. Uh, for example, aged people tend to have multiple chronic diseases like uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, um, hypertension, diabetes, and when they're using uh, these medicines together, uh, a number of them could be inhibiting absorption of um, one of these uh, supplements from their gut, or be leaching some of the sup uh, some of these uh, uh, macronutrients from their body, resulting into age-related uh, anemia. Then in children, it's usually due to uh, primary hematological abnormality, and um, it's important to uh, for children to refer them for specialist um, attention when this is so. In Nigeria, most of all we have in children uh, usually results from um, what is it called, uh, sickle cell disease. Now, in terms of clinical presentation, what will most patients look like when uh, they come in? Um, also to note, an anemia, chronic anemia is a risk factor for, uh, for heart failure, you know? So it's, it's um, even though it's not mostly seen as a clinical emergency, it's important to address, you know, it's important to address anemia when you recognize it in the clinic. Acute on onset anemia is characterized by cardiorespiratory symptoms, such as fast breathing, like I mentioned, the person may be tired, may appear, may be tired, feel lightheaded and breathless, or be after doing a little task. While chronic anemia is characterized by weakness as well, fatigue, uh, headaches, symptoms of heart failure, uh, vertigo, faintness, cold sensitivity, usually in the extremities, that's in the fingers and in the toes of the legs, okay? And there's usually something called pallor or loss of skin tone, okay? So you watch out for all of that. If you identify quickly, um, it's important to raise their, uh, or get the attention of either the patient or the healthcare team that you're working with to uh, resolve that, okay? Iron deficiency anemia is characterized by glossal pain, smooth tongue, reduced salivary flow, pica, that's compulsory eating of uh, non-food items, for example, you find people can sometimes chew on the end of virals or 
you know, different items that are not um, uh, not necessarily food, right? And then you have compulsive eating of ice as well. Um, when you see, this is usually common when um, hemoglobin is less than nine grams per deal in either male or female, okay? Um, it's important that when uh, you catch any of these symptoms, please refer uh, or identify the patient for treatment. Neurologic effects uh, like numbness and ataxia uh, usually occur with uh, B12 deficiency in, in uh, absence of anemia, that's in absence of frank anemia. And then in terms of psychiatric findings, irritability, depression, memory impairment, these ones are not specific. These are just, uh, for example, in patients with renal disorders, if you begin to find irritability, depression, that's you know, if you begin to see neurologic findings in patients with renal disorder, most likely it may be more related to their um, you know, progression of their disease than uh, even the anemia that they are experiencing, right? Um, anemia with uh, acid deficiency is not usually associated with neurological psychiatric symptoms. But then um, when there's B12 deficiency, because B12 is also important for um, uh, neurologic uh, patency, so it's important to watch out for that. In terms of diagnosis, um, Anemia is commonly um, clinically diagnosed in Nigeria, especially in community practice. Uh, sometimes the, the using uh, physical, physical methods, uh, like checking the eyes, if they are pale, looking at the palms, if they are pale, uh, you know, uh, looking at the skin color and uh, skin ten, uh, tone, right? It's, uh, you can, make a guess, you know, as to if a person is anemic or not, you know, but um, that, that's not the classical which you diagnose anemia. To diagnose anemia, usually you need, um, you know, um, a laboratory test. So um, there's usually a laboratory test for um, full blood count. And then um, of course, you're also going to think about uh, hemoglobin, uh, or hem hematocrits, which will give you uh, the, the full diagnostic criteria for uh, anemia. Like we said earlier on, um, if, you, if in males you find in a general population uh, where you do not know what is normal in that male or in that female, uh, if it's less than 13 grams per deal in male or less than 12 grams per deal in female, then you can identify uh, uh, anemia, okay? Um, usually using uh, some cellular criteria, you can also identify which is um, iron deficiency or which is uh, uh, folic acid def uh, deficiency or B12 deficiency. But in most cases, like I said, uh, once you identify anemia, uh, most of the treatments, you know, um, Give a broad, give a broad treatment containing um, either iron, uh, containing iron with a mixture of uh, folic acid and B12. As I'm sure all everyone or okay, maybe, well, let me see. Uh, at least half of this room has taken uh, some hematinic of some sort before, which has helped to treat anemia. Now, in terms of um, if a differential diagnosis has been done. Um, like I said, diagnosis is not uh, the forty for a pharmacist, so uh, nobody's going to ask you about this algorithm. It's only presented so that you can understand why, um, for example, we said earlier on about hyperproliferative um, uh, and the other uh, pathological classes for uh, you know, anemia. Now, in terms of treatment, once a differential diagnosis, okay, sorry, uh, differential diagnosis means that uh, out of all the causes of a certain disease, you have now done further tests and further, um, you know, laboratory 
we've, we've collected more laboratory data and identified what is causing this person's particular condition. Okay, so after you've done that, um, that then we begin to talk about the goals of treatment. So you begin to treat. The goal of treatment, um, there are four goals of treatment for anemia. The first is to alleviate signs and symptoms. So we can. Yes, oh, so. thank you. Thank you. Thanks for responding. Okay, so um, we talked about correcting the underlying etiology. So if it's iron deficiency anemia, it's to replace iron. Uh, if it's B12, uh, vitamin B12 deficiency, um, supplements with vitamin B12 in whichever form the patient can absorb it and make use of it. Similarly with uh, um, folic acid, you replace the folate in the, in the form that the patient can you know, uh, make use of it. In, in patients who are taking um, antifolates, we use uh, folinic acid in those patients. In case I do not remember to mention that again, um, in patients who are taking antifolates, uh, for example, metotrexate, you supplement the patient with uh, folinic acid in such cases. Um, another thing is, um, okay, replace body stores. So, yeah. so what's um, an antifolate, sir? I said metotrexate. An antifolate is used, um, usually the, the, the class of medicines is usually used in treatment of cancers. All right, moving on. Uh, and then, of course, also prevent recurrence of the anemia. Uh, so those are the four goals of therapy. So let's quickly take iron deficiency anemia. The, the easiest, um, often the, the most frequently occurring and the easiest to treat. Uh, oral ion therapy with soluble ferrous ion uh, salts is the most common um, uh, resolution. Um, it's usually presented as ferrous sulfate and the most, the most challenging part of it is just the stomach disturbance that comes with supplementing with these supplements. Um, so it's usually advisable to take it in between meals and that reduces the, uh, that reduces the, the, the discomfort that patients feel with taking it, and it also improves uh, appearance as well. Um, they're usually uh, not enteric coated. Uh, I mean, just basic 200 milligram elemental ion in two or three divided doses uh, daily is provided for patients. Ion is poorly absorbed from vegetables, grain products, dairy products, and eggs. So the best is to provide meat, fish, and poultry as uh, supplements for the patient. Um, <clears throat> for when you're administering the tablet, like I mentioned, um, if, you're, if you're doing um, ion, ion uh, uh, ferrous sulfate, you can uh, take it with, between meals. Um, it will reduce the absorption, but it does um, administer ion at least one hour before meals because food interferes with absorption. But administration with food may be needed to improve tolerability. For patients who have stomach disturbances with iron, it can include stomach cramps and vomiting, right? So for those patients, you need to administer in between meals. It will reduce how much iron is, uh, you know, is absorbed, but usually whatever is absorbed is enough to help in replenishing their iron stores, okay? Um, usually you do not even want so much iron stored in the liver because that can also, especially in renal disease, because that can also precipitate renal failure, okay? But at least um, for people who have those symptoms, administer it with food, in between food, sorry, not with food, in between food. So that means when they are eating, they take it, not that they will take it after they finish eating. Uh, it will still result into stomach cramps. So they need to take it when they are eating, okay? For those who do not have that problem or for those who it's really, who, whose uh, hemoglobin um, levels are rather low, 
you may be able to administer if they do not have issues with tolerating it, <clears throat> administer it before food. Uh, for patients who have malabsorption issues, consider IM, uh, you know, um, ion or IV uh, formulations. Uh, this does not mean that um, you will get faster response. Okay, so this is another important consideration. Uh, so the easiest is usually considered in this case where, except the person can't tolerate uh, oral ion, it's best to either give uh, oral ion, uh, either before meals or, be, or in between meals, okay? But then not, uh, this is just to mention that giving the person IV does not mean that person will respond faster than somebody taking oral <clears throat> ion. Ion dextran, sodium ferrogluconate, ferromoxetol, and ion sucrose are all parenteral ion uh, preparation. Similar efficacy, but different molecular size, pharmacokinetics, viability, and adverse effects. Uh, in terms of B12 and folate deficiency anemia, for patients with B12 deficiency, you supplement with oral B12, uh, which is as effective as parenteral, uh, even in patients with pernicious anemia, because the alternate uh, B12 pathway is independent of the intrinsic factor. So, um, there is really no need uh, in, in anemia to, except the patient, like I said, cannot tolerate oral uh, supplementation. That's when you think about using IV and all of those other uh, routes. Um, so you can initiate B12 supplements at one to two milligrams daily for one to two weeks. Um, this is usually, you, you, you will usually find an overage of this in the OTC and um, OTC um, hematinics that are available in many uh, pharmacies. So there's really no specialty uh, medicine for this. Um, in patients that do not, um, that do not um, tolerate oral therapy uh, or where there's neurologic symptoms that are, uh, you know, present, then you can do IM 1000 micrograms daily, which is still about, uh, you, know, uh, you know, for one week, then um, do weekly for a month. Uh, but it's advisable to switch to oral B12, you know, as soon as possible because of the side effects of uh, IM formulation of uh, vitamin B12. For folic acid, oral folate, um, much, much, very common. Uh, sometimes it's called uh, uh, expensive urine. The so oral folic acid can be given as five milligrams, uh, one milligram or 400 micrograms. In fact, you'll find out that in Nigeria, 400 microgram tablets are more expensive than five milligram tablets. So most people just opt for the regular five milligram tablets things. Uh, the excess will go out, will usually go out with urine. Um, and it's taken daily, once a day, uh, formulation. Um, for anemia of inflammation, um, it's less specific. So the idea is to first treat the underlying anemia, uh, sorry, underlying inflammation. And then um, also uh, a, a few more checks may be necessary. For example, being certain that they, uh, there's no um, ion storage loss. Um, it's important to, to identify that, but also to note that um, deciding to uh, just pump the person, uh, the person with uh, anemia of inflammation with, um, with um, supplementation does not necessarily work. So it's important to first uh, identify the under, underlying inflammation resolve that, and then the uh, patients will now also respond to treatment. Um, a class of medicines also used um, the erythropoiesis stimulating agent, ESS, can be considered in anemia of inflammation, especially in patients with um, um, renovascular disease or patients with um, uh, cancer, 
who who may have uh, maybe some suppression or whose medicines um, and or oncology drugs, those cancer drugs, are uh, suppressing uh, bone marrow function. Right, you can administer erythropoiesis stimulating agents, and examples can be epoetin alpha. Um, 550 to 100 units per kg three times weekly or that before it's in alpha at 0.45 micrograms per kg once weekly. Um, also to note that it, um, it, this may result in iron deficiency. So supplementing with um, a ferrous, you know, um, either tablets if the patient can take oral medicines is useful in such patients. And as soon as possible, you discontinue the erythropoiesis stimulating agents as well. Uh, their toxicities are uh, much more than uh, for other supplements that are used in treating anemia, um, like iron, uh, B12, and folate. The toxicity for erythropoiesis stimulating agents are much more. You can have hypertension. You can have. Um, it can also increase the vomiting that patients already have from taking their oncology drugs uh, can also lead to uh, chronic headaches, can have fever, bone pain, fatigue. Uh, really in some patients, you may have uh, new, new uh, cancers as well, okay? Um, you also monitor hemoglobin during uh, ESA therapy. In patients with anemia of critical illness, Parenteral iron is often used, but it's associated with a theoretical risk of infection. So routine use of ESAs or RBC transfusion is not supported by clinical studies. And one, like I said, the risk of, um, the risk of side effects are greater and uh, it may not be worth it. And uh, no clinical studies also show that uh, you know, that they are preferable over um, basic supplementation. Now, in children, anemia of prematurity is usually treated with RBC uh, transfusions, that's red blood cell transfusions. Um, using things like epoetin alpha is controversial because it's not been shown to clearly reduce transfusion requirements in children. Um, infants from 9 to 12 months uh, administer iron sulfate three milligrams per kg once or twice daily between meals for four weeks. And then you continue for additional two months uh, in, people, in responders to replace storage ion pools. Those and schedule of B12 should be titrated according to the uh, clinical need. Similar for uh, folic acid, one to three milligrams. So usually what you have in the... A uh, regular folic acid tablet is sufficient for children as well. Now, how do you monitor treatment outcomes? For iron deficiency anemia, you should have, um, you should have uh, reticulocytosis in a few days. And then at least within two weeks of starting iron supplementation, the hemoglobin level should improve. And then reevaluate the patient as required. Um, Usually within two months, um, hemoglobin levels should return to normal, um, but you, you still continue after two months so that you can replace the storage uh, ion. Uh, for megaloblastic anemia, uh, signs and symptoms usually improve within a few days after starting B12 or folic acid. Um, urologic symptoms are not resolved as soon as the HB improves. They may take longer to improve or maybe irreversible in some patients. Um, but usually it should not get worse when you're treating. Um, in this case, you should see reticulocytosis within two to five days. Reticulocytosis is observed using uh, uh, microscope. Not, uh, it's not like a, you, know, you take blood sample and there you can observe reticulocytosis, that new cells that are being uh, generated, okay? Uh, hemoglobin begins to rise a week after starting B12 therapy and should normalize in one to two months. 
and then hematocrit should rise within two weeks after starting polytherapy and normalize within two months. Uh, so similar time uh, that you think hemoglobin should return to normal between ion therapy and B12 or polytherapy. When you're using um, erythropoiesis stimulating uh, agents, you expect uh, reticulocytosis should occur within a few days, monitor ion levels uh, because they deplete ion. And then of course, um, you are also concerned that uh, ion storage, that ferritin levels may also decrease. So um, if you notice that, then you continue supplementing with ion for at least, um, uh, I think up to 12 months as well uh, after that. But once you notice the clinical response, you discontinue the uh, either epoetin or dabipoetin and continue with um, ion therapy. In children, you monitor their hemoglobin, their hematocrit, and RBC indices six to eight weeks after initiation of ion therapy. Um, for premature infants, uh, you do the monitoring weekly just to be sure that they do not reverse back into uh, anemia leading to uh, uh, complications. So do we have any questions for anemia? I have a question, sir. Yes, please go ahead. Um, please, what are the symptoms of um, intramuscular vitamin B12? You said um, oral vitamin B12 is preferred compared to IM because of the symptoms. So my question, are, like, what are the side effects of IM vitamin B12? I mentioned that oral is preferable to IM or parenteral doses because both of them will give you the same, um, the same clinical response. But then parenteral, uh, parenteral route of, um, of administ administering drugs are generally more risky. And then you can have, for example, you can have uh, um, injection site reaction, we can also have um, different kinds of um, risk attacks to parenteral uh, roots. But then generally, like I said, since the clinic, there's no benefits, uh, you know, between the two, except when there's um, neurological uh, involvement, right? So since the benefits are the same, there's no need to uh, go for parenteral roots if the patient can take uh, oral medicines. Okay, so. Thank Any you other questions? Much. You're welcome. Any other questions on anemia? Okay, so I quickly will go on to discuss sickle cell disorder, the second um, classical disorder under hematological diseases. Sickle cell disease um, basically is, uh, we, class, we say sickle cell disease when someone has um, homozygous HBS, like I mentioned earlier, uh, where uh, the person has SS. Uh, the sickle cell syndrome itself, you can divide into sickle cell traits and sickle cell disease. Sickle cell traits is where Hereditary conditions um, have resulted into this patient or this person having uh, the presence of at least one sickle, one sickle hemoglobin in their red blood cells. Usually, it's a pair, um, you know, and you want to have at least either an AA or an AS. Um, so sickle cell trait is the heterozygous inheritance of one normal beta globin gene producing hemoglobin A and one producing hemoglobin um, S, right? So you have um, that individual having HBAS, right? Uh, but for people who have homozygous inheritance, right? They have the two 
uh, beta globin genes producing hemoglobin S. So it's called homozygous HPS, and that's, uh, you know, SS. There are a few things um, I should mention. Um, HBSS, um, or what, what we're discussing in terms of sickle cell disease is qualitative, not quantitative. Uh, for example, when you talk about thalassemias, right? So um, you find in, in such patients, um, you, 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 they have HBSC, right? And um, in such patients, they, you, you may hear things like um, uh, treatment or treatment can result into changing, um, you know, or result into the person ha um, having more, um, uh, that's someone who is um, homozygous, you know, people, people sometimes mistake it and say, uh, if you're homozygous, if you if you get, uh, for example, infusion with fetal hemoglobin, you can be converted into uh, HBC, HBSC, and then it will be less um, less serious than somebody who has HBSS. Uh, that's not true. So one is quantitative, one is qualitative. The one we're talking about is qualitative, meaning that HBSS. Uh, I don't understand. Sir. I'm trying to help you see um, in, in some in some um, some healthcare workers tend to confuse, for example, the thalassemia diseases and having a, uh, which are a quantitative disease are different from a qualitative disease like HBSS. Patients with HBSS, regardless of how much transfusion you give them the new hemoglobins they will form are going to be HPSS because the gene they have inherited. So except you want to treat all the cells of their body, you cannot change them from being HBSS. Do you understand? So uh, in a way, what I'm saying is sickle cell disease is not a curable uh, condition. Is that helpful? So does that mean that thalassemia is, um, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sir. Does that mean that, that the particular condition you mentioned period can be actually treated with blood transfusion? It can be treated with blood transfusion and some other medicines. But for HBSS, for patients who have, uh, who have inherited a homozygous uh, beta globin gene, right, producing HBS, that's HBSS patients, there is no way to treat that, okay? Um, it can be, it, bone, bone marrow transplantation can reduce the severity, but regularly, I mean, what they produce will continually be HBSS. I hope that is clear. Now, uh, in terms of the disease process, clinical manifestations are actually due to uh, what, what you see as clinical manifestations when we get there, are uh, actually due to um, you know, the impaired circulation that happens, um, red blood cell destruction, and then stasis of blood flow that are attributed to disturbances in RBC polymerization, that the red blood cells tend to agglutinate together, that they come together and form larger uh, bodies than normal. And so they can block small vessels, you know, and those small vessels are usually in the legs, in the extremities of the legs, um, can also be uh, in the gut, can also be, um, uh, where's that again? Okay, also in the, in, the, in, the, in, the blood, in the blood vessels supplying the penis as well. So that's why for uh, patients who have uh, sickle cell disease, they are at an increased risk for um, priapism, which is uh, painful erection that doesn't go down after usual sexual activity, right? Um, and then 
it can also be due to membrane damage of the red blood cells. Uh, additional contributing factors can include functional asthenia and increased risk of bacterial infection, uh, deficient opsonization and coagulation abnormalities. Like I mentioned, the red blood cells are more sticky than they usually should be um, because there's ongoing inflammation as well within the cells. Uh, polymerization allows the oxygenated hemoglobin to exist as a semi-solid gel that, uh, that protrudes into the cell membrane, distorting the red blood cells into sickle shapes. Those sickle shaped cells uh, increase blood viscosity and encourage sludging in the capillaries. So you find there's slower movement in the lower parts of the capillaries and blood vessels, leading to local tissue hypoxia. That they starve the local tissue of blood, and also this uh, increases a lot of or can result into several uh, uh, disease processes as well. In fact, in in patients who have a lot of uh, uh, splenic onslaughts, they can have something called acute. Um, uh, uh, what's that thing called again? Uh, it's a condition when the spleen becomes almost um, almost uh, useless. Okay, it doesn't it doesn't carry out its regular uh, physiologic process anymore. Uh, repeated cycles of cycling, you know, upon the oxygenation and on cycling upon uh, oxygenation damage the red blood cell membrane and cause irreversible sickling. Those rigid sickled red blood cells are now easily trapped, resulting in shortened circulatory survival and chronic hemolysis. So those red blood cells are easily taken out you know, for destruction. And then of course, anemia, chronic anemia becomes a recurring uh, clinical impression in those patients. Sickle cell disease involves multiple organ systems and the clinical manifestation will depend on the uh, genotype. Uh, cardinal features of sickle cell disease are hemolytic anemia and vasoocclusion. Symptoms will We cannot hear you, sir. Will usually be delayed until the child is at least forty-six. We cannot hear you, sir. Um, so usually four to, four to six months um, after the baby has at least converted all of their fetal hemoglobin to adult cell hemoglobin, uh, that's when the begin to appear. Uh, so you begin to find pain, fever, pneumonia, splenomegaly, and then you have pain and swelling of the hands and feet in children. Um, usual clinical signs include chronic anemia, fever, pallor, uh, atralgia, that's pains in the joints, uh, the scleral ectoros, uh, abdominal pain, weakness, anorexia, fatigue, enlarged liver, spleen, heart, and hematuria, uh, blood in the urine. Uh, there are also acute complications, which can include fever and infection. Uh, which may result from sepsis caused by encapsulated pathogens. Stroke, stroke is a common feature in patients with sickle cell disease. And the risk for that is also increased with anemia, right? So it's a double jeopardy for, I mean, anemia is a double jeopardy for patients uh, with sickle cell disease. So it's, it's important to always uh, take care of that. Um, there's also acute chest syndrome characterized by pulmonary infiltration, respiratory symptoms, and uh, equivocal response to antibiotic therapy. Um, importantly, what we usually hear about sickle cell disease is the sickle cell crisis. This is the most, um, it, it, the pain is so discomforting and you know, uh, you just wish you didn't have it anyway. Um, you know, so it, it's one of the most commonly socially identifiable symptom of sickle cell disease. And it can be caused by infection, dehydration, stress, or sudden temperature changes. The most common type is vaso-occlusive uh, crisis. 
which is manifested by pain over the involved area. Like I mentioned, it can be over uh, the leg or wherever you find that the cells have agglutinated and, and blocked, you know, uh, arteries, the blood vessels, that area becomes inflamed. There's a lot of redness, pain, and, uh, you know, so you have you, the, the patient experiences pain over those areas that are involved uh, without change in uh, their hemoglobin. A plastic crisis is characterized by acute decrease in hemoglobin. So if you have, if, if the patient has a uh, vaso occlusive, there's no change in, in hemoglobin level and the pain is localized. A plastic crisis is characterized by acute decrease in hemoglobin with decreased reticulo, uh, reticulocyte counts manifested as fatigue, dyspnea, pallor, and tachycardia. In uh, a, a plastic crisis, what you usually find is that the person is easily fatigued or, you know, sometimes um, you may even dismiss it as a symptom of um, depression, but, it, you know, um, most patients, if they tell you they're in a crisis, that, that's why it's, uh, it's a bit... Um, when, when the patient is telling you this is what I'm experiencing, it's important to respond and, you know, because you, for example, with a plastic crisis, um, the, the fatigue, the dyspnea, the, the, um, the, the inability to breathe and all of that are the most, uh, you know, clinically identified uh, symptoms. Another thing that's important with uh, the crisis is a splenic sequestration. Um, it's in, what, in, in, in splenic sequestration, you have massive enlargement of the spleen, there's hypotension, shock, and sudden death in young children. But where patients survive, repeated infections like that lead to autosplenectomy. Uh, yeah, this is what I was talking about earlier on. Uh, autos, in autosplenectomy, the spleen just um, kind of loses function, okay? Um, so even though you think the patient has recovered, they're not having this um, um, uh, splenic sequestration anymore. But if you check, you will find that the spleen has actually stopped to be functional, right? Um, chronic complications that's most you'll find in most uh, patients include pulmonary hypertension, bone and joint destruction, ocular problems, colathiasis, uh, cardiovascular abnormalities, including enlarged heart uh, hypertension. You can also have depression, hematuria, and other renal complications. In children, there could be delayed growth and delayed sexual maturation as well. Patients with um, sickle cell traits are usually unremarkable. In fact, a lot of people have sickle cell traits. Um, they may do better with, um, with malaria, but then uh, except for rare painless hematuria, there's really no, uh, really no symptom. Okay. Now, in terms of diagnosis and treatment, sickle cell disease is usually identified during neonatal screening. Um, sometimes if it is missed during neonatal screening, um, when the infant begins to have those symptoms that we mentioned in childhood, uh, after those six months of, um, after those six months when fetal hemoglobin has been fully converted, then the symptoms will start and then the patient can be easily identified. So most people are diagnosed in childhood. Uh, in terms of laboratory findings, you have low hemoglobin, the reticulocyte count, uh, platelets, low platelet count, white blood cell count, and simple forms on peripheral smear. Um, treatment goal, important. One, reduce hospitalization, reduce complications, reduce pain, pain of crisis, and reduce mortality. Like I said, it's a chronic condition. It can be treated. So you manage uh, the patient and also manage their expectations as well. Um, because patients like this require long-term or lifelong uh, multidisciplinary care, um, intervention should include education,
Can't hear you, sir. On? Oh, sorry. Sorry, I, um, sorry for that. Um, um, okay, where was I? Okay, yeah. So I said interventions should include education and then general measures in Nigeria can include um, prevention of um, those fiscal, fiscal methods to prevent malaria since that's a huge risk factor for uh, uh, precipitating crisis in, in uh, sickle cell disease patients. And then uh, preventive strategies like um, uh, chemo preventive practices like um, taking paludrine um, you know, regularly for preventing malaria and then treatment of complications and acute crisis. Routine Im immunization is important, especially for patients who, um, who may be at risk for, uh, you know, who may, who may have uh, easy, who, who may be at risk for infections, bacterial infections. So vaccination against common, um, common infections are very important. And uh, you could have vaccination against influenza, many good folks are, infection and mucosa uh, vaccinations as well, very important. Now there can be prophylactic uh, penicillin uh, in children until about five years of age. Uh, that is important because for children, generally you cannot prevent some of the exposures. So um, having, those, um, having those, that routine antibiotic cover or prophylactic cover helps to reduce um, helps to reduce um, infections in those children. Now, importantly, folic supplementation is important uh, because for most, um, for most, what's it called? For most um, sickle cell disease uh, patients, um, having, um, for, for most sickle cell disease patients, um, what is it called? Uh, reticulocytosis may be depressed. That's the process of forming new red blood cells may be depressed. And so you want to always uh, be uh, in the forefront that's improving, ensuring that there's improvement in, um, in uh, red blood cell, uh, in making new red blood cells. So always, always, uh, supplement with folic acid is recommended in adult patients, that's adult STD patients, pregnant STD women, and patients of all ages with chronic hemolysis. Um, now, there's a, a class of medicines, the fetal hemoglobin inducers that are very important. Um, what it does is increases um, Um, increases... you, Hello? We can hear you now. Okay, okay. Sorry, I, I guess uh, my network is fluctuating. Just give me a minute. Let me... Sorry. Um... Okay, um, so fetal hemoglobin inducers, uh, because fetal hemoglobin directly affects polymer formation, uh, increases in this correlates with decreased red blood cell cycling. Remember that I mentioned that fetal, fetal hemoglobin in, um, in, um, in the newborn child between the ages of, uh, you know, when they're born and up to four to six months, reduces all of these symptoms that, you know, uh, start in the patient from about six months where all fetal hemoglobins have been uh, converted, right? So um, fetal hemoglobin reduces the RBC, red blood cell signaling and adhesion. That's why you have the lower 
um, uh, the lower symptoms in such patients. And the most common or uh, the most used agent is hydroxyurea. This chemotherapy, it's a chemotherapeutic agent. It's used in several uh, diseases as well. and has an effect on blood cells and stimulates hemoglobin, uh, fetal hemoglobin production. It's indicated for patients with frequent painful episodes, severe symptomatic anemia, acute chest syndrome, or other severe vasoclusive complications. Um, patients taking this, like I said, would have decreased RBC cyclone and adhesion. Also, they will have fewer um, uh, vasoclusive crisis or uh, even sequestration when placed on this. Starting dose is usually 15 milligrams per kg as a single daily dose. Um, another agent is desitabine. Uh, which has been investigated in adults who do not respond to, to hydroxyurea. It's not currently licensed, but then um, it's still on clinical trials. Chronic transfusions are indicated for primary and secondary stroke prevention in children. Uh, transfusions are usually given every three to four weeks or are needed to maintain desired uh, HBS levels. The optimal duration is unknown. Uh, because um, it's still a lot of, uh, there, there's still a lot of, um, you know, most diseases that are considered um, third world diseases. Uh, for example, you, the largest population, the, la the largest concentrations of people with um, sickle cell disease is in Nigeria and also uh, around um, Asia as well. Uh, of course, the highest population is, uh, well, it's debatable, but I think it's currently around the Asian region. But then most of the countries affected are rather poor countries. So there's a lot less attention to these diseases considered third world diseases. And so uh, once you find one drug that works, it takes a lot of time, it, it takes a lot of time and slow investment into health research before you come up with a new uh, medicine again. Uh, risk for um, chronic infusions or chronic transfusions include alloimmunization, hyperviscosity, viral transmission. Um, this is also uh, this is also a challenge because for that's chronic uh, transfusions, that's chronic blood transfusions please. Uh, this is also a challenge because sometimes when, when blood is screened, um, I don't know, maybe it's a Nigerian problem anyway. Sometimes they screen blood and then the blood ends up, the, the, it's either maybe it's not properly done or uh, sometimes blood that is screened ends up, um, I mean, with, um, with viruses that you do not screen for. Essentially, yeah, you screen for HIV. Uh, you know, importantly, and then you also screen for hepatitis uh, in the blood, but then there's still uh, certain uh, other bacteria and stuff that are not screened for. So um, viral transmission is still a concern during uh, transfusion. Then there's, there can also be volume and ion overload. Volume overload can also lead to a stroke, and then there can be transfusion reactions where the person just goes into shock. There can also be uh, allogenic um, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, which we talked about earlier on that um, uh, some people can get, um, uh, oh my God, what is this again? Um, that some people can get bone marrow transplantation and that this is the only way that you can have um, some sort of curative uh, therapy for sickle cell disease. It's not that the gene of the person has changed. The gene has not changed, but then you're harvesting stem cells, you're harvesting bone marrow tissue from somebody else who has uh, probably uh, heterozygous HBS, Right, so that person is either AS 
or you are harvesting bone marrow tissue from somebody who has homozygous HBA, right? So the person's um, hemoglobins are normal, right? So if you're harvesting that kind of blood, uh, that kind of bone marrow tissue and transplanting into this patient, right? It's an experimental procedure, very expensive, but then um, it, it improves the person's life for longer. Um, I, I think so far, um, even though my note is saying that uh, the best candidates are younger than 16 years and have some severe complications, the, the people being, being accepted for these treatments are, are, you know, they're becoming older, uh, even up until the young uh, 20s and 30s, people are still opting to go for um, this hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. And it looks like it is, you know, going to be, um, it's going to be the way forward for people who really want to get a cure. Um, the concern is just that it may not be affordable in the long run. No, no one can really say. Um, risk must be carefully considered, including mortality, graft rejection, and secondary malignancies. Uh, secondary malignancies, for example, um, if there's a cult blood transmission of, um, of cancer cells, you cannot tell until several years down the line when those uh, cancers begin to mature in the person that has received the transplantation. So those are still ethical concerns that are being looked at. But definitely anybody who gets stem cells transplantation would be uh, producing uh, blood cells that are similar to that from the person uh, from whom they got the transplant. Um, in terms of patients who, this is a, uh, this is a treatment um, uh, cascade for people with, uh, for people who get treated with hydroxyurea. Um, usually you want to screen for pregnancy, <clears throat> um, uh, screen for compliance and all of that, if yes, then the patient is a candidate for hydroxyurea. Um, if in a female that is likely to get pregnant or a male who's uh, sexually active, then um, there's a need to use um, condoms in them. Uh, reason being that uh, there's a likely link between hydroxyurea use and um, and um, what's it called? Um, and deformities in the newborn. Okay, so you always want to use uh, contraception, that's condoms, in people who are uh, sexually active and are or want to take hydroxyurea. Um, like we mentioned earlier on, you you initiate with 15 milligram per kg per day, and then um, uh, you may increase until uh, until the best effect is no, is clinically noticed that fewer um, fewer venoclusive uh, events and then improvement in uh, anemia. Uh, once a person responds, there's less pain, uh, fewer ICS episodes, um, increase in hemoglobin, um, fetal hemoglobin, increase in uh, or, or reduction in severe anemia improved well-being, there's no myelotoxicity, then you continue therapy. But if there's no response, then assess compliance and then consider inability to respond to therapy. Um, at that case, you may begin to increase the dose until the highest that's tolerable. Um, and really there's no, there's no marker for saying this is the highest that's tolerable. It's just that once you begin to have side effects that are higher than normal, then you uh, withdraw the hydroxyurea. But currently, hydroxyurea is the mainstay of therapy in people who have at least um, three or more episodes in a year. Okay, very important to note that. No, so how so do you treat? Uh, I said hydroxyurea 
is the mainstay of ter therapy treatment in patients who have at least three or more um, uh, episodes. And that's the um, vaso occlusive episodes crisis. Okay. Now, treatment of complications. Education, like I mentioned earlier on, education is it's, it's very important because it's a chronic disease. So you want to educate the patient so they can identify their own symptoms. Uh, if, for example, they feel, they begin to feel like they're going to have, um, uh, what's it called, um, a crisis, you need them to be able to identify what is going on, what they did that's leading to that. And, you know, um, sometimes it's, it may be, for example, it could be hydration. Uh, just getting them to maintain hydration can reduce how many episodes happen and all of that. Also, you want to educate the patient because you want to improve compliant uh, adherence to their medicines as well. Um, so educate the patient to recognize conditions that require urgent evaluation, balance fluid status and oxygen saturation of at least 92% are important to avoid exacerbation during acute illness. Uh, red blood cell transfusions are indicated for acute anemia. Uh, also, when there are severe vasoclusive episodes, because there will be more, there will be increased uh, red blood cell loss during vasoclusive episodes, that during crisis and during procedures that require general anesthesia or uh, contrast media. For example, if somebody who's taking who's a sickle cell disease patient has to have, um, what's it called, um, CT scan, a CT scan that requires opaque media that, you know, uh, transfused into them, you should be thinking of blood transfusion afterwards because that will lead to some blood loss as well. Uh, promptly evaluate any fevers, you know, um, also empiric Antibiotic therapy should provide cover against uh, encapsulated organisms uh, in these patients. Up until the age of five, prophylactic um, antibiotics are useful. But after the age of five, you expect that the person would have built some sort of immunity and can begin to also practice self-care and uh, proper hygiene so that, you know, um, they're not as often exposed to uh, organisms, uh, bacteria, and others as much. Um, in patients with um, with um, fever, um, can do spirometry, uh, appropriate fluid therapy, uh, use broad spectrum uh, antibiotics, including macrolides or quinolones, and then for hypoxia, that um, or acute distress, oxygen therapy is useful. Uh, steroids and nitric oxide are being evaluated, but for now, uh, basically just using uh, oxygen therapy is a cheaper source, right? Now, in patients with complications like priapism, uh, it's been treated with analgesics um, directly injected into the uh, erect penis tissue. Um, sometimes anti-anxiety agents may also help and then vasoconstructors to force blood out of the corpus cavernosum, uh, for example, epinephrine, and then you can use vasodilators to relax the smooth muscle. Uh, commonly used here is hydralazine. Um, in treating crisis, uh, basically what you provide is supportive treatment. So blood transfusions may be indicated for severe or, or symptomatic anemia. Uh, treatment options for uh, splenic sequestration, a, a crisis as well, includes observation alone, especially for adults because they tend to have milder episodes. And they tend to have milder episodes because over time, you know, from their young age up until uh, once they've had repeated episodes of splenic uh, sequestration, the spleen itself uh, becomes largely non functional. So, uh, you have milder episodes in adults. So chronic transfusion can also be done to delay the nectomy.
that's where the spleen becomes uh, redundant or non-functional. And then uh, splenectomy after a life-threatening crisis, after repetitive episodes or for chronic hyperspinism. If the spleen really, really becomes very large and life-threatening, then it can be uh, removed surgically. Hydration and analgesics, that ensuring the patient is hydrated, either through um, IV fluids and uh, giving IV, uh, analgesics are usually useful for vaso-occlusive vaso uh, crisis. Administer IV fluids or orally if the person can, you know, um, can tolerate oral fluids. Monitor, avoid volume overload. Uh, also treat if there is uh, an infection that precipitated that, of course, you treat, initiate emp empiric therapy if indicated. Uh, usually in Nigeria, um, malaria treatment is also included just in case. Um, NSAIDs can be used for mild to moderate pain. Uh, if the pain is really severe, then opioids like uh, codeine or hydrocodone is used. Um, treat the severe pain aggressively uh, with morphine. Um, if you cannot get morphine, then you can use um, uh, pentazosine is available as well in Nigeria. Um, treat severe pain with an IV opioid, titrated to pain relief, um, what I mean here by titrated pain relief is that we all have different pain thresholds. So for somebody, um, a, a little pain or a little inflammation can make them feel like dying, like they're dying, right? So as long as the patient complains about pain, please continue to, uh, you know, respond to that and treat with um you know, depending on the, on how they, you, you can use the pain scale, um, ask them, for example, asking them between one to 10, with one being the, one being like um, maybe hitting your hand against the table to 10 being like, your feel, you feel like your bone is being crushed, right? Uh, how would you graduate? How would you say your pain is? Okay, those kind of pain scales help the patients to, uh, communicate how much pain they, they, they are experiencing. Um, so in that way, you achieve patient-controlled analgesia. So uh, as a healthcare provider, you monitor their pain and also ensure that you have a good mix you know, to prevent excessive side effects. Um, Sometimes, because of because we suspect that our patients are becoming addicted to opioids, we, we tend to deflect or tend to with, uh, withhold pain relief from them. But there is no cost for that. Um, if you treat pain effectively and aggressively, most patients will not um, will not titter into uh, uh, opioid addiction. So how do you monitor treatment outcomes? Evaluate patients on a regular basis uh, to establish baseline symptoms, monitor their changes and provide age appropriate education. Um, eva evaluate um, complete blood counts, do reticular uh, site counts every three to six months. So patients will usually have to have a regular hospital visit at least every half year that's, you know, once they are above, uh, you know, once, once, they, once they are young children up to the age of four or five, up until even throughout life, you know, they need to uh, continue to um, access care at least every half year. Screen patients for retinopathy, very important. Um, high sight is, our eyes have some of the smallest vessels, so you need to continue to assess and ensure that you provide care for them. Uh, assess efficacy of hydroxyurea by monitoring the number, severity, and duration of sickle cell crisis as well. With that, we come to the end of discussions for sickle cell disease. Any questions? <laughs>